Hello, everybody. Greetings from the Department of Political Science at the Chittagong University. Uh, this is a program between uh, the Center for Asian Studies of the Department and uh, the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Japan. First of all, uh, I have to uh, hand over to Professor Monwar Kabir, who is chairing the webinar. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Monwar Kabir is the director of the Center for Asian Studies, and uh, he is also a professor of our department, the Department of Political Science. Professor Monwar Kabir. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Anwar Begum. Uh, we don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether Vice Chancellor Madam is here or not, but let me, uh, <coughs> let me say a few words assuming that she is in the program. Uh, Honorable uh, Madam Vice, Chair, Vice Chancellor, our Pro-Vice Chancellor, assuming that she is also going to join, the Dean of Social Science Faculty, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador Ito Naoki, respected colleagues, their students, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the two day Japan lecture series jointly organized by the Center for Asian Studies, Department of Political Science, University of Chittagong, and the Foreign, Affairs, Foreign Ministry of Japan. Extra Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japan. Uh, distinguished scholars from Japan are going to deliver uh, lectures on some very important issues like uh, integration in Asia Pacific and Japan's territorial issues from historical perspective. I think this two-day lecture series will enormously help us understanding, have better understanding of the issues at hand. I would like to stress that this center for Asian studies stands for a cooperative, stable, prosperous Asia based on peaceful coexistence. We do believe in the peaceful settlement of all disputed issues for peace, security, stability, and prosperity of Asia. This Center for Asia, the Center for Asian Studies offers itself as an academic platform for sharing the views of the scholars from different countries. We have already hosted scholars and delegations from Thailand, India, China, Japan, the United States, Hong Kong, and of course, from Bangladesh. We don't carry, I stress, we don't carry any whatsoever political and ideological baggage and bias. This one, that is today's program, is another such program that we have hosted previously. It's unfortunate that we could not uh, do some works to, to arrange uh, seminars or other programs due to global pandemic situation, and we all know about it, we are all aware of it. This one is another such program. With your support, the support from uh, our colleagues, our students, and the people and authorities from various countries of Asia, like Japan, uh, we will continue, we can continue with our academic endeavors in future. Once again, I welcome you all in this program. With that short note, I conclude my brief speech. Now I request Professor Dr. Anwara Begum uh, to conduct the rest of the proceedings of the program. Thanks once again. Please do enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Manuel Kabir. And uh, 
a warm, a warm welcome and greetings to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Mr. Itunaoki and uh, Professor Urata uh, from Japan and all the Japanese uh, officials involved in it. And uh, greetings to my colleagues and the students who have joined. I request uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Itunaoki to deliver his speech now. Thank you, Professor Begum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Shubo uh, Konaho. Good afternoon and konnichiwa. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to launch the Japan lecture series today with the Center for Asian Studies, Department of Political Science, the University of Chittagong. First, I would like to thank uh, Professor Monoar Kobir and Professor Anawara Begum for organizing and hosting this academic uh, dialogue. So our initial plan was to invite Dr. Kobil to Japan to exchange his thoughts and views with Japanese academy and government officials. However, unfortunately, we had to give it up because of the corona pandemic. I would say uh, it was a silver lining that Dr. Kobil made this webinar available for wider uh, audience who had strong interest on Japan's uh, economic policy and uh, integration, economic integration of Asia. My big thank you goes to, of course, Dr. Urata for having agreed to speak before us. Dr. Urata has been researching economic integration in Asia and Asia Pacific, focusing on regional trade liberalization, FDI promotion, and supply chains integration. Dr. Urata, in fact, promoted various FTAs and EPAs for Japan. Initially, certain circles of bureaucrats and politicians in Tokyo were reluctant to conclude bilateral FTAs. Dr. Urata pushed the agenda of trade liberalization and investment promotion through FTAs as an academic mainstay. Japan has come all the way to ratify the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2018, which is TPP minus the United States. And Japan also signed a regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, agreement last year I'm sure Mr. Urata will talk about those agreements later. Behind the scene, Dr. Urata consistently gave in invaluable advice to the Japanese government to see the initiatives moving forward. Japan has been a development partner for Bangladesh almost throughout its history of 50 years of independence. Now, JICA has been doing three flagship projects in this country. Dhaka Metro, extension of Terminal 3 of the International Airport, and of course, deep seaport development in Matabari, just south of Chittagong. All of those projects are significant in laying the Bay of Bengal industrial growth belt, what we call Big B. Matabari will be the regional hub of industry, energy, and connectivity. Chittagong and Matabari will connect Bangladesh more efficiently and effectively with India, ASEAN, as well as East Asia. Our dream is to build a mini Singapore on Mat Moheshkari Matabari Island. We all expect Bangladesh's graduation from the LDC status in 2026. Bangladesh seeks to become a dialogue partner to ASEAN and study possible FTAs or CEPAs with China and some ASEAN countries. Bangladesh needs to be integrated into larger markets in Asia as the Bangladesh economy's future also lies in ASEAN and East Asia. Bangladesh may not be Dr. Urata's familiar territory yet, but today I'm sure we will have meaningful and engaging discussions from a broader perspective, which Dr. Urata will present beyond the Bay of Bengal region. With further integration into ASEAN and the East Asian economy, Bangladesh will undoubtedly enjoy opportunities for further rapid economic growth. In 2022, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between Japan and Bangladesh. I earnestly hope that milestone year will spur academic exchanges and today's webinar will play a prelude for that. I sincerely wish that this Japan lecture series will inspire scholars and students to know more about Japan's perspective on subjects of our mutual interest. 
and even to study in Japan in the future. Thank you very much. Shobaike Onekto Nabad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency, Ambassador Ito Naoki, Mr. Ito Naoki. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are de delighted to present the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Chiragang. I requested her and uh, I requested her uh, humbly to come to the Department of Political Science and deliver her lecture because uh, she does want to uh, do that, I know, and she is always uh, encouraging academic activities in her university and various departments. And usually if she gives her word that she will come, she usually comes and that the, her presence here proves that. I'm going to uh, uh, let Professor Shirin Akhtar deliver her lecture. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, please? Yes, we do. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. 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 Sorry. Sorry, His Excellency. Thank you, Professor Dr. Bhuya Mohammed Manuar Kobi, Director, Center for Asian Studies, Department of Political Science. I also thank His Excellency, Mr. Ito Naoki, the Ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh, Officer Benu Kumar De, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Chiragong, Professor Dr. Mustafiz Rahman Siddiqui, Dean of Social Science Faculty, Professor Dr. Anwar Abegam, distinguished scholars and guests from Japan and Japanese Embassy in Dhaka, and my esteemed colleagues and dear students. I appreciate all your presence here. I would like to thank the Center for Asian Studies, Department of Political Science, University of Chittagong, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japan, for organizing this webinar on some very important issues. I am delighted to be here in such a gathering and the webinar on very important issues such as economic integration in Asia Pacific and Japan's territorial reach at a very significant issue of the Asia Pacific region. I am sure that this webinar will shed some new lights on the theme. Bangladesh and Japan have been very good friends since the time of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibarawal's government. Japan has always been one of the most important de development partners of Bangladesh. Huge development activities have been going on the Mahishkali not too far from here. This webinar, I am sure, will improve our knowledge about Japan and economic integration, connectivity, trade, and investment in Asia Pacific region, including Bangladesh. We need more such collaborative academic programs and interaction for building greater understanding between the two friendly countries. It is my sincere hope that academic cooperation and collaboration between Japan and Bangladesh will continue in the days ahead and will become stronger as time passes. On that optimistic note, I am inaugurating this webinar and wish it great success. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. I thank Professor, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Chittagong, Professor Dr. Shirin Akhtar. Can I sit for, here? Of course, you can sit and and 
and watch the webinar from yes, here. Yes. It, uh, it, is, uh, it is our privilege and the honor that you have come. And uh, now I will continue with my speech. I was supposed to, Madam, begin my speech when Robin called me, your PS called me that yes. you, would, you, you had consented to come to the department. Such a great honor. Uh, First, uh, we Bangladeshis like to speak, uh, we're taking more time, but I know that this webinar has very strict time yes. limits. Yes. We have already uh, encountered some problems. So I will uh, just say a few words uh, on three points. One is the Center for Asian Studies. The second is uh, academic cooperation between uh, Bangladesh and Japan. And the third is a Japanese foreign policy. The first point, uh, you have already heard a little bit about the center and that it's a broad-based platform and, and we host uh, scholars from Asia and we have also hosted a scholar from the United States. So uh, as uh, uh, the Japanese uh, counterpart, members of the Japanese counterparts are aware that the United States is a Pacific country, I mean Pacific Ocean country. And uh, we are uh, open-minded and we do not uh, have any bias towards any ideological perspective that has been made clear. And this center, the point that I want to make very, very clear is that this center is not funded by any external actor and we do not receive any funding from anybody. It is Professor Monwar Kabir who funds uh, this center so that we can remain independent. Now about academic cooperation between Bangladesh and Japan, we have some expectations some aspirations, uh, some hopes, uh, and uh, those are, we really want to have a, a academic cooperation between Bangladeshi scholars, Bangladeshi academic institutions, and uh, the Japanese academic community. And uh, the forms that we hope it will take is uh, 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 exchange of visits and uh, networking, and of course, exchange of uh, some resources. I will specify that a little later. Most importantly, training. Japan is a developed country, and uh, we hope that our young scholars, we have very young scholars who enter the academic life at the age of 24, 25 without PhDs, that uh, these young scholars will get training from Japan. And I'm talking on behalf of uh, social sciences scholars. We are aware that Japan uh, has uh, generous opportunities uh, for uh, generous options for young science scholars. Uh, we have some PhDs, biological science PhDs from Japan. But we have very few PhDs and very few masters uh, in, in the social sciences from Japan. I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the department so you understand uh, your excellency, the ambassador. We have in the department two American degrees, American PhDs, one Australian PhDs, and uh, four Bangladeshi PhDs, three Chinese PhDs new Chinese PhDs and one uh, master's degree from Japan only and one master's degree from India. So you understand uh, this reflects the condition of uh, Japanese uh, PhDs, uh, uh, the condition uh, that, that uh, our young scholars in, uh, are in, in obtaining Japanese PhDs. So my request on behalf of the department as well as the social science faculty will be that uh, uh, Japan and the Japanese academic commun community will pay attention to increasing number of scholarships for social science, young, young social science scholars in Bangladesh, uh, in, in the, in, especially in the University of Chittagong and in other regions too. That goes about academic cooperation between Japan and Bangladesh. Now, a few words about uh, Japan's foreign policy. And uh, we are really small people to be talking about Japan's foreign policy, but I'll just make a few uh, remarks. And Japan is a strong ally of the United States. And Japan is in the Indo-Pacific strategy that uh, uh, the United States uh, has formulated, although Shin, uh, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, uh, claimed an important role in formulating this uh, strategy, but we all know that, that, that it's, a, it's really a US-led strategy. But uh, Japan uh, tried to, uh, Japanese policymakers, uh, I remember hearing a, a speech by 
uh, the National Security Advisor of Shinzo Abe, uh, Kentaro Senora, and uh, he said that Japan is different. Although Japan is inside the Indo-Pacific strategy, Japan is different because Japan does not want to uh, militarize or securitize its activities within the Indo-Pacific strategy. And uh, no, Japan uh, wants to train different countries of Asia so that the, those countries and provide maritime equipment so that those countries can, uh, 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 can, can secure their maritime space themselves. Uh, yes, indeed, we want to believe that Japan is different and Japan will understand the problems and aspirations of the developing countries of Asia yeah, Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, better uh, than uh, than other major powers, and we hope that uh, Japan plays a constructive role in the in the Pacific uh, uh, coalition and the Quad, so that the, our maritime spaces are not militarized, and we as countries are not forced to choose choose sides. Like we do not, we were in the Cold War, we know what happened during the Cold War and we are divided. We don't want any more divisions. We want peace, stability and prosperity so that we can grow and develop. With that, I end my, end my few words that I wanted to say. And uh, I invite Professor uh, Urata, excuse me. I invite Professor Urata to deliver his speech, but before that, I just want to briefly introduce him. Is that okay, Professor Urata? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the Japanese uh, distinguished professor present with us is uh, Professor Shujiru Urata. He is currently senior research advisor in the Academic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. He spent his whole academic career, basically his whole academic career as a, a teacher in, um, uh, in the University of, I, no, I just, uh, could, you, could you just say the name of uh, your university? Yeah, it's a Waseda University. Waseda, Waseda University. Waseda University, he spent his academic career there and he received his PhD in 1978 from Stanford University. And I'll mention one of his uh, uh, publications, uh, one book that he has written, his specialization is economic relations, obviously his excellency the ambassador mentioned. And uh, I, I'll mention one of his books and that is Industrial Politics in East Asia. And I have another book, if I can, I may, I may mention, and that is Measuring the Cost of Protection in Japan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and now Professor Urata will speak. Professor Urata. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Began, for a uh, kind introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, Vice Chancellor Akta and uh, Professor Kabil and Ambassador Ito for giving me this uh, Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to talk about the uh, 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 topic of my interest, well, that is a uh, regional economic integration in Asia Pacific in front of the uh, uh, guests and the students. Uh, let me share my slides. Um, let me, let's see. Yes, uh, I'll be looking at the uh, developments regarding economic integration from late 1980s through the current period, like 2021. So uh, last 30 years, we saw a number of important uh, developments, uh, not only in economics and other and like political science field. And for example, uh, we encountered Asian financial crisis in 1997, 1998. And also uh, we uh, had the uh, global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. And also as uh, currently we are faced with a, a crisis, it's a COVID-19 crisis. Uh, when it comes to economic integration, as I'll be, uh, talking about today, there are a number of interesting and important developments. 
uh, <clears throat> and before I go into the uh, my main talk, I I understand this is a part of a lecture series, so I was thinking about giving some definitions or terminology for particularly for students who may not be familiar with the uh, 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 the terms and. Uh, and the uh, definitions. So what we are looking at is the map of uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, and what I'll be talking about is as uh, Ambassador already mentioned, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, covering uh, 10 ASEAN countries. Uh, I think uh, all of you know what ASEAN means and what ASEAN countries are, uh, and uh, ASEAN 10 countries plus uh, five, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. These 15 countries make up uh, RCEP, uh, which was uh, signed uh, last year, now in the process of ratification. And uh, another uh, important mega FTA, we call FTA, is large number of members, mega FTAs, is CPTPP, uh, Comprehensive and Progressive Transpartnership, uh, Transpartnership, uh, Transpacific Partnership, uh, including uh, 11 uh, Asia Pacific countries. And so these two, RCEP and CPTPP, are the main focuses of uh, my talk. But in addition, I'll be talking about so-called ASEAN plus one FTAs, ASEAN plus India, ASEAN plus China, ASEAN plus Korea, ASEAN plus Japan, and ASEAN plus Australia and New Zealand combined. So there are five ASEAN plus one FTAs in action already. Uh, China, Japan, Korea, FTA, uh, it's been negotiated for some time, but still in negotiation. And the uh, last one here is called Free Trade Area of Asia Pacific, uh, which is an initiative which is proposed by the United States in 2006, uh, which includes 21 APEC economies, Asia Pacific Economic Corporation member economies. So these are the uh, uh, original agreements that I'll be looking at. And uh, as I said, ASEAN here includes all these 10 countries. When I say ASEAN plus three, that means ASEAN plus China, Japan, and Korea. ASEAN plus six includes ASEAN plus three plus Australia, New Zealand, India. And APEC has 21 economies. And the importance of APEC is the, its inclusion of uh, China and the United States. Uh, La lastly, uh, free trade agreement. Uh, this is the uh, trade policy or, uh, or, or trade policy, which eliminates tariffs and non-tariff barriers on trade with FTA members and maintain tariffs and non-tariff barriers on trade with non-FTA members. So this is the uh, agreement which I'll be talking about. And FTAs, as I just explained, and as you can uh, imagine, is a discriminatory trade policy. Uh, you know, this gives a preference to members and discriminate against non-members. Uh, this violates a uh, basic principle of the GATT and WTO, that is non-discrimination. But FTAs are, are, are accepted as exception uh, to the uh, GATT and WTO given that they satisfy certain conditions. Uh, conditions include like elimination of substantially all tariffs and a completion of FTA within certain period. So uh, FTAs are again, uh, exceptions to the GATT and WTO. So the best uh, uh, policy in my view is the uh, trade liberalization under currently WTO. But uh, as the uh, uh, WTO members are facing a very difficult challenges to move forward, uh, many countries uh, have chosen to use FDAs to liberalize trade and investment. 
to achieve economic goals. Okay, uh, FTAs uh, by definition are a trade agreement, uh, but uh, many FTAs uh, which has been in, in, in action, which has been implemented, include not only trade liberalization, but also liberalization in services trade, uh, tra liberalization in foreign direct investment, and uh, many FTA, FTAs have various rules, such as rules on intellectual property rights, e-commerce, government procurement, and so on. Uh, and because, partly because of the uh, comprehensiveness of the arrangement, FTAs are uh, very often called economic partnership agreements. And this is the expression that Japanese government uh, uses uh, rather than uh, EPAs rather than FTAs. Uh, again, main objectives of FTAs include, in my view, achieving economic growth by expanding trade and FDI, uh, as well as implementing domestic policy reform. Uh, it is uh, rather difficult to uh, implement domestic policy reform uh, from like inside, from internal forces. Uh, so uh, countries are eager to use external pressure through FDAs uh, to carry out domestic policy reform. And second important objective, in my view, of uh, FDAs is to establish friendly friendly relationship or uh, external relationship with uh, 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 like-minded countries. So these are uh, a very brief uh, explanation of the terms and definition that I, I'll be using in my talk. Now, uh, let me go into uh, uh, introduction. Uh, going back to 1980s and 1990s, East Asia uh, did achieve uh, quite rapid economic growth, very successful in achieving economic growth. And uh, the uh, drivers of uh, fast economic, rapid economic growth are, in my view, market forces. That's why I call it market driven. And, and what is happening is that the, uh, because of the uh, market forces, uh, many multinational corporations, set up their uh, affiliates in East Asia, and then forming so-called supply chains or global value chains uh, that contributed to uh, the uh, uh, rapid expansion of trade and investment and uh, uh, that contributed to achieving high economic growth. Uh, and so we saw uh, the progress toward regional econ economic integration uh, through the uh, forces given by, driven by market. And this is a graph which show, not, not so clearly, but uh, uh, I, I guess I can tell that there's the uh, increasing importance of intra-regional trade. In intra, when I say intra-regional trade, that it trade among ASEAN plus six countries. Uh, the share of uh, intra ASEAN plus six countries trade in total ASEAN plus six uh, countries trade increased from 1980 to like uh, year 2000, then stayed more or less about the same level. In other words, for ASEAN plus six countries, intra, intra regional trade became more important. Uh, this is a sign of marketing integration. <clears throat> and what is interesting is the importance of increasing trade in intermediate goods. Uh, intermediate goods includes mostly parts and components. So in East Asia, uh, parts and components were actively traded uh, between and among countries. And that uh, is the, uh, uh, the factors behind that, the so-called uh, fragmentation strategy uh, carried out by multinational corporations. Many multinational corporations, many Japanese corporations, they broke up their production process into various pieces. Uh, I call them production blocks. And each production block is located 
in a country or region where that particular production process can be uh, uh, carried out most efficiently or at the least cost. Think about automobile company. Uh, in the past, all the automobile production is done in Japan. But over time, they kind of, you know, break up the, uh, they broke up the production process into pieces, production of engine, production of windshield, and then so on. And they locate one of these production block into various countries throughout East Asia. And that formed regional production network or regional supply chains. Or if you look at this from global perspective, it is global uh, uh, GBC, value chain GBCs. And this is typical, well, this is a kind of schematic uh, figure showing how production network is being formed in East Asia, very complicated. You know, each one of these are production blocks, which I just explained. Uh, and compared to North America, uh, East, what is happening in East Asia is much more complicated. Many countries are involved. And uh, final products are produced by parts and components which are produced in different countries. And they're assembled into one, say, country for uh, final products. And the final products will be export or will be you know, sold in local market or, or exported to uh, East Asia or exported to Europe, exported to the United States. And that is the uh, uh, production network. And this is one uh, uh, specific, specific example of a production network. This is a hard disk drive producer in Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, this producer procures parts and components from all these places and then produce hard disk drive. So this is a production network. And so as a result of this uh, formulation or construction of production network, uh, that of course uh, led to expansion of trade, particularly trade in parts and components <clears throat> and uh, uh, final products. Uh, <clears throat> that contributed to rapid economic growth of the region. And the important factors which led to the construction of production network is well, several. One is the uh, trade liberalization, which uh, took place over the years. What we are looking at is the tariff rates, uh, average tariff rates for ASEAN countries uh, shown by these lines uh, declined over time. And this is uh, uh, average tariff rates for uh, ASEAN plus, plus six countries. When I say plus six countries, Australia, China, India, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand declined. That of course reduced the so-called trade cost. That made it much easier for companies to undertake foreign trade. But, but what, what we are also seeing in this uh, uh, slide is increasing number of non-tariff measures. Non-tariff measures are, as the uh, term indicates, uh, measures which are not you know, related to tariffs like SBS, TBT, <clears throat> and all, all these, all, all sorts of non-tariff measures which are increasing. That is uh, uh, concerning because that will of course uh, 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 reduce the chances of uh, foreign trade by increasing trade costs. But that is a challenge that we have to, we, we face. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> let me turn to 1990s, late 1990s. Uh, so up until late 1990s, I just discussed the uh, market forces led to regional integration in East Asia, and that contributed to rapid economic growth. But toward the end of 1990s, or maybe early, uh, 1990s, uh, East Asia saw the emergence of free trade agreements, okay? And the, uh, that is what I will be discussing. Uh, it was, sorry that it was a rather long uh, introduction. I'm aware of a time constraint, so I should uh, speed up. Now, 
what we are uh, looking at is the number of FDAs uh, in the world uh, reported to the YAT before 1994, uh, reported to the WTO after 1995. And the line shows a cumulative number of FTAs. And uh, uh, number, of FTA, number of FTAs started to increase uh, in, around 1990, and then just continued uh, increasing. Uh, two lines here. One is the, uh, this yellow line is the, all the FTAs reported to uh, the GATT or WTO, uh, but some of the FTAs uh, uh, expired. Uh, uh, and so the uh, blue line shows the existing uh, or FTAs which are in force. But at any rate, what is important is the uh, 1990s. And just think uh, what happened in 1990s, early 1990s. This is a period when the Yuga Iran negotiation uh, liberalization negotiation uh, were uh, facing problems. Uh, they were uh, kind of stuck and they could not really move forward. And uh, under such circumstances, countries thought that trade liberalization is difficult. So why don't we go for uh, liberalization of trade with like-minded countries? And that of course led to the formation of FTAs and that continued even after the WTO was established in 1990, 1995. <clears throat> and uh, East Asia was a rather late uh, comer uh, in this uh, uh, so-called FTA race, uh, but they caught up uh, very quickly. And this is the number of FTAs reported by East Asia uh, at the, like 2019, which is quite, quite a, a large number compared to other regions. So uh, East Asia has, has been uh, seeing uh, 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 emergence of uh, uh, FTAs in recent years. Now, uh, FTAs in East Asia began with AFTA. AFTA is ASEAN Free Trade Area, uh, which covers, at that time, this was uh, established in 1993, and at that time, ASEAN has six member uh, countries. And then later, uh, four new ASEAN members joined, uh, they, they are called CLMB, uh, Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Uh, and so they joined. Uh, and why did uh, uh, six ASEAN countries form uh, after uh, ASEAN free trade area? There are several reasons. Uh, okay, so again, uh, because of time, I, I'm going to skip some of these uh, points, but uh, if you're interested, you can get this uh, slide from uh, Japanese embassy, I think. Uh, so uh, what are the uh, factors which led to the formation of FTA? Uh, there are two kinds, external factors and internal factors. Uh, as for the external factors, as we just saw earlier, regional integration uh, or FTAs in the world is uh, increasing very rapidly. And that uh, uh, made uh, us and realize that, that they need to really form a similar uh, uh, trade block uh, in order to secure their, their market. Uh, and then China's rise, China started to uh, uh, started to uh, do very well in economic performance, and that attracted many foreign direct investment from the rest of the world. And ASEAN was concerned with uh, 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 you know, losing opportunity to attract foreign direct investment. So by forming a one big uh, uh, market, uh, ASEAN market, uh, they were hoping to get more investment from the rest of the world. And there are also internal factors uh, uh, that led to the formation of AFTA. Uh, they uh, realized the importance of economic cooperation to achieve so-called resilient ASEAN. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, sorry, this, this is 1997, 98, uh, but in 19, like 92, 93, they're also concerned with the uh, 
resiliency, partly because of China's rise and so on. But toward the end of 1990s, uh, Asian financial crisis uh, uh, led them to uh, think about the importance of uh, economic cooperation among themselves. And also uh, they were interested in uh, establishing a competitive and equitable region that led to the formation of the uh, AEC, uh, ASEAN Economic Community, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, let me quickly go to the other parts of the East Asia here, uh, uh, Japan, China, Korea, mostly. Uh, Japan, China, Korea were not interested in free trade agreements because FTAs are discriminatory. And these countries thought WTO is at most, uh, is of at most importance. And because the Japan and Korea particularly they thought that they gained a lot from being a member of the GATT or the WTO. Uh, China, uh, it was not a member of WTO until 20, 2001. So China was not interested in regional policy before joining the WTO. So again, uh, uh, these three countries were not interested in FTAs until the late 1990s. Uh, what happened in 19, late 1990s, Asian financial crisis, which I mentioned earlier, Asian financial crisis put the Korea in a very difficult economic situation. And Korea needed a regional uh, cooperation, particularly cooperation from Japan and other countries. And so Korea led the, uh, uh, this initiative to discuss the uh, uh, forming some kind of regional framework uh, to deal with uh, uh, possible crisis in the future. Uh, and one of the form of uh, uh, regional economic cooperation was FTA. So uh, uh, Korea led the uh, talk of region-wide FTA, uh, which uh, comes into force later. Now, turning to the 21st century, uh, China uh, became a WTO member in 2001. Then China proposed FTA with ASEAN. Uh, this uh, this uh, became later as ASEAN plus China FTA. Uh, there are several motives. Of course, uh, they were uh, interested in expanding their uh, trade and investment relationship with the uh, ASEAN countries. And also they'd like to establish friendly relationship with ASEAN countries or regional policy. And that led to the uh, emergence of so-called domino effect. Uh, Japan, Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand followed China to establish ASEAN plus one FTAs. Um, before that, uh, particularly in Japan and Korea, uh, they uh, were uh, busy uh, forming uh, bilateral FTAs. Uh, here, uh, sorry, I go back to here. Singapore proposed Japan to have it bilateral FTA, Singapore also proposed Korea to have bilateral. Korea approached Japan to discuss possible FTA, bilateral FTAs. So Korea and Japan were interested in bilateral FTA, but China, uh, uh, as I just explained, came up with this idea of uh, uh, ASEAN as a group, not just uh, bilateral, but the kind of group wide FTA. Uh, and so uh, ASEAN plus one FTA as here, uh, lower left hand corner here. Uh, they were formed and they became, uh, uh, they came into force around by 2010. Now, uh, when it comes to, uh, well, uh, this is the uh, development leading to the establishment uh, of RCEP negotiation. Uh, there were interesting, maybe in my view, uh, rivalry, important, I, sh I should say, rivalry between China and Japan. Uh, ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, FTA. Uh, here, of course, ASEAN uh, played a central role, but China was very interested in having ASEAN plus three FTA. 
uh, but uh, Japan uh, proposed to, to invite India, Australia, and New Zealand uh, as a democratic countries. So there are kind of you know, uh, rivalry between China and Japan uh, concerning either ASEAN plus FTA or ASEAN plus six, plus six FTA. But when it comes to uh, the actual negotiation, it was ASEAN plus six FTA negotiation that led to the RCEP. Uh, and I was involved in a number of these study groups, which uh, studied the uh, possible uh, formation or possible impacts of the uh, uh, formation of ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six FTAs. A number of academics were involved in this uh, process. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> when it comes to China, Japan, Korea FTA, uh, as uh, everybody knows, uh, uh, Japan has difficult problems with China and Korea, history and political and so on. So although the uh, negotiation started, but the negotiation were not moving uh, forward so much. Uh, in the meantime, uh, APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, members started to discuss FTA. Uh, to be more specific, uh, Chile, Singapore, New Zealand, Brunei formed uh, a four country FTA, which became TPP later, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And then uh, this P4, uh, or later called TPP, uh, began a negotiation for the expansion of the uh, uh, issues like uh, financial services. And then US became very interested in participating in this discussion and later became uh, 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 a member of F, uh, F, F, uh, number of the member of TPP negotiations. Okay. Well, why US was interested in this uh, TPP? One reason uh, many people think is that the uh, US saw the emergence of discussions on East Asia uh, grouping, East Asia uh, regional integration. And US was now, it was very much concerned about the uh, loss of uh, market uh, in East Asia. Uh, so uh, US proposed to have like FTAAP, which includes 27, uh, 21 uh, APEC economies. Uh, now, 2010s, so the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, TPP negotiation is enlarged TPP, meaning uh, not only you know, four uh, original members, but in addition, uh, eight members, including the United States, and later uh, Mal Malaysia, Canada, Mexico, and Japan joined and became 12 member uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, and uh, they uh, signed agreement, uh, but the US withdraw from TPP. Uh, uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump, uh, decided to withdraw the United States uh, from TPP. Uh, so became uh, TPP 11. In other words, excluding the United States, remaining 11 countries got together uh, and formed uh, CPTPP. In the process, Japan uh, played a very important leadership role. Uh, and uh, uh, this TPP, uh, later called CPTPP, uh, became, uh, uh, well, entered into force in December 2018. And this year, uh, the UK applied to join uh, formally. Now, uh, RCEP, uh, this is uh, uh, ASEAN plus six FTAs. Uh, <clears throat> And the, uh, the RCEP negotiation began after a TPP negotiation began. Uh, it, it was uh, a lot of people think that the uh, start of TPP negotiation triggered the start of the many uh, uh, regional FTAs like RCEP, CJK, China, Japan, Korea FTA, Japan, EU FTA, and also uh, trans, trans transatlantic 
uh, FDA called TTIP. Now, uh, the, this TTIP, uh, TTIP I, uh, stopped negotiations, so it's gone. Uh, but the uh, important point here is that uh, FDA triggers a so-called uh, domino effect, like snowballing effect. And that's what happened. Uh, RCEP negotiation uh, concluded and signed uh, last year, uh, last November. Uh, but without India, in India withdrew from RCEP negotiation uh, uh, a year before. And now so 15 country uh, 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 framework. Comparison of CPTPP RCEP is very briefly, uh, coverage is more comprehensive for CPTPP uh, than RCEP. Level, level of realization is higher for CPTPP than RCEP. Uh, and, uh, and CPTPP, it has high aspiration. Uh, it's called the 21st century FTA, it's a model FTA. RCEP uh, people, uh, members are more interested in equitable development of the members. Economic cooperation is more important than maybe uh, economic growth. But what are the challenges for CPTPP and CEP? Uh, for CPTPP, uh, enlargement, uh, now 11 member uh, countries. Uh, UK applied to join, uh, but the many countries like to see US come back to CPTPP, but uh, as far as uh, uh, we know, uh, President Biden is not so keen on returning uh, the US to CPTPP. Uh, for RCEP, uh, ratification uh, process began, uh, not yet uh, finished, uh, hoping to uh, 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 enter into force toward the end of this year or early next year. Uh, and what is important in my view, uh, once it is uh, uh, implemented, is to uh, 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 make sure that the countries uh, abide by the rules that they committed. Uh, and particularly what, what I'm, to be more specific, I'd like to see China uh, uh, abide by the rules and commitment that they, they did because it has um, quite um, ambitious uh, rules, um, in my view, for China. And this shows the comparison of the components or, or chapters uh, covered by CPTPP, RCEP, and the uh, WTO. Uh, important difference is the uh, state-owned enterprises uh, uh, included, chapter on state-owned enterprises included in CPTPP, but not RCEP, mostly because of China, I think. Uh, labor is not included, and China is, you know, it's very sensitive. Uh, environment, I think China can join this, uh, because China is very uh, keen and interested in environmental issues, so there's no reason why China cannot have this chapter. But at any rate, uh, major and big differences are some of the uh, uh, very challenging issues for China to accept. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, very quickly, Japan's regional economic integration policy. Uh, Ambassador Ito made a very, uh, you know, clearly uh, the uh, Japan's regional economic uh, integration policy, so I'll be very brief. Uh, and objectives, in my view, at, at, at least, uh, establish a rules-based open and free trade and investment environment, environment in, the, in Asia Pacific. This, of course, will benefit uh, countries involved, and particularly, I should say, to be honest, Japanese companies. Uh, Japanese market, local market is shrinking, so to speak because the population started to be, population of Japan started to decline. So for many Japanese companies, their activities outside of Japan have become more important and more so in the future. So it is very important for uh, Japanese companies to operate in an environment where, you know, rules-based, open and free. Okay, uh, so uh, achievements of Japanese government in terms of uh, regional economic policy is, as I just uh, earlier mentioned, 
Japan played a very important role in completing TPP 11, CPTPP. Uh, Japan was successful in getting Japan EU or EPA, and Japan contributed uh, quite significantly to the signing of RCEP. Um, finally, uh, free and open Indo Pacific F4IP initiative, which uh, is rather new, uh, but originally it was, uh, uh, I think, indicated by the uh, Japanese government or, or uh, Prime Minister Abe in 2007. But in, in, in but the uh, it was more recent, I guess, that the discussion on F F4IP became quite active, uh, which includes many things. By the way, this shows uh, FDAs involving Japan. Sorry about the, uh, I could not find any good figure in English, but uh, you can see this uh, uh, world map of uh, Japanese uh, FDAs uh, of, uh, evolved over time uh, and covering uh, many countries. And this is a FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific Strategy by the, by the Japanese government. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Begum uh, earlier uh, said that the US have Indo-Pacific uh, uh, policy or initiative, so uh, does Japan, and so does Australia, Canada, uh, India, uh, ASEAN. So many countries are looking at this Indo-Pacific as a very important region. <clears throat> and Japan is interested in building uh, high quality infrastructure, infrastructure to increase connectivity. Uh, final remarks, uh, very quickly, uh, as I tried to uh, uh, discuss or argue that uh, FTAs contribute to economic uh, growth through promoting trade and investment. Uh, and uh, in Asia Pacific, CPTPP and RCEP are two important mega FTAs. Uh, that can contribute to economic growth uh, and maintain rules-based trade environment, not only for the region, but for the world as a whole. Uh, uh, challenges uh, of, for uh, CPTPP and RCEP include, uh, here again, I'm repeating myself, uh, realization of the commitments, enforcement of the rules, and expansion of membership. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, FTAs face opposition from inside, from internal uh, uh, factors. Uh, to be more specific, uh, sectors of, or, or workers, people who work in the uh, sector where they face trade liberalization, opposed to FTAs because they may lose their job, they may lose their income, and there's a good reason for them to uh, oppose to this idea of uh, FTAs. But what is needed for economic growth to take place is uh, a shift uh, from, you know, move people and capital money from non-competitive non -competitive sector to competitive sector. That's how you achieve economic growth. And FTA gives a very good opportunity to do so. But in the meantime, it is true that people get hurt. So the government needs to provide social safety net or safety net to deal with these issues and training, uh, education, maybe uh, uh, some uh, income compensation and so on. So government uh, needs to be ready to provide such assistance so that the uh, FDA can be realized and uh, economic growth can be realized. Uh, some lessons for Bangladesh. I have to admit, I have very limited knowledge about Bangladesh, although some of my former students have PhD in, uh, back in Bangladesh. Uh, and I uh, learned some uh, uh, economic issues facing Bangladesh and so on. But again, uh, here, some lessons just from me, this is a personal view. Uh, participating in regional production network is a key for economic growth. 
And in order for a country or the company to get involved in uh, uh, GVCs, go up global value chain, is to attract foreign direct investment, to get uh, uh, connection with uh, foreign firms or multinational corporations. And important uh, factors, important ways to promote foreign direct investment uh, uh, is to have uh, uh, business friendly environment, which can be characterized by open trade and FDI regime uh, and uh, our infrastructure, uh, good infrastructure, hard and soft, uh, hard meaning like a transportation communication system, soft infrastructure include educational system, legal system and so on, and good logistics, capable workers, good governance and so on. So these are the, uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't need to really explain this because you, all of you know the importance of these for uh, achieving economic growth. And uh, this is a list of FTA that I found from WTO website that uh, Bangladesh has. And uh, uh, finally, let me just say, uh, because of COVID uh, and because of US-China uh, conflict, I think uh, many companies, including Japanese companies, are interested in diversifying their supply chains or global value chain. And so countries such as Bangladesh, Cambodia, and you know, Sri Lanka, uh, they have a very good opportunity uh, to attract these companies who are interested in diversifying their network away from China or in addition, in addition to China, so-called China plus one strategy. And there are things called Thailand plus one strategy and so on. But again, I think Bangladesh uh, uh, has a very good opportunity now to attract foreign companies. Uh, let me end my presentation. Thank you very much for uh, uh, listening. Thank you, Professor Urata. Uh, it seems that we have come very close to 3 Sorry. p.m. Yeah. No, that's that's all right. Uh, we learned a lot from your uh, presentation. Ask uh, my esteemed colleagues. We still have five minutes, and hopefully, I ask Mr. Ken to see uh, call the company and see if we can continue beyond that 3 p.m. mark. And he said that Professor uh, Urata and His Excellency the Ambassador might want to leave. Okay, so if my colleagues uh, want to ask uh, questions, yeah, I can't hear you. You can hear me. We can't hear you. You can hear me. You can write uh, your question in uh, the uh, chat panel and uh, uh, we will be able to see, but um, I, we are just a few people on the screen. If you, Professor Monor, could we have any question, you can no, uh, ask the beginning question, or I can ask the beginning question. And you ask Professor, the beginning, you too? Madam, you ask the beginning yes. question and ask the students and the participants to raise the question hands. Raise hands for those who want to ask questions. They may push the raise hand button. There is a raise hand button, uh, and they can if they click on the raise hand button, then that means they want to ask questions. Let me just tell the students and the colleagues in Bangla. Yeah. raise hand button আপনারা যদি সেটা তুলেন তাহলে তারা ওখান থেকে আর কি জাপানের मिस्टर কেন মনে হয় দেখতে পাবেন এবং আপনাদেরকে প্রশ্ন করার সুযোগ দেবেন এছাড়া যে চ্যাট বক্সটা আছে এই চ্যাট বক্সটাতে লিখে আপনি এন্টার টিপুন তাহলে প্রশ্নটা আমার কাছে চলে আসবে আমি বিগিনিং क्वेश्चनটা আপনাকে একটু ইয়ে করি আই এম গোইং টু আস্ক জাস্ট আ জাস্ট আ ভেরি শর্ট क्वेश्चन দ্যাট ইজ অন দা থিম অফ ডাইভারসিফাইং ভ্যালু চেইনস ডক্টর উরাতা and i know that when the covid began there are uh, calls uh, for uh, for the western and japanese companies to leave china and uh, uh, the, uh, and secure their value chains and uh, the japanese government gave some incentive announced incentives for the japanese companies to leave and even there i saw a new newspapers that good news good news japanese companies will be coming to bangladesh and bangladesh can offer them home so uh, to your knowledge 
uh, how many companies, what proportion of Japanese companies left China after COVID began for supply chain problems and the problems related to the COVID? If you have, uh, could give us some idea. Well, thank you very much for the question. Maybe Ambassador Ito may be a better position to know about the uh, Japanese companies coming to Bangladesh. But uh, just, uh, before I ask uh, uh, Ambassador Ito to respond, uh, what I know is the uh, uh, many companies uh, did not abandon China. They just added you know, uh, uh, their affiliates in other countries. Uh, like I said, China plus one uh, 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 strategy. China is a very important market for Japanese and other uh, country uh, companies. So they like to maintain their business in China, but particularly uh, for the companies who are producing uh, products which are say exported to the United States, uh, their concern with the operation in China, uh, not just because of COVID, but because of US-China friction. So they try to diversify their operation away from China. And then like, you know, uh, Bangladesh is one of such uh, targeted countries, I think. Uh, but again, sorry, I, I, I don't have a good record of uh, 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 companies uh, coming to uh, Bangladesh or, or any other. I know that many uh, have decided to go to Vietnam. That I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have but, heard about that. Right, right. Yes. So, uh, yeah. I have. I have one statistics that I heard about. It was uh, because I sometimes like uh, lectures given by Japanese professors <laughs> and uh, online, and uh, I have a habit of uh, watching those. Uh, very <laughs> interesting. A uh, very, a very diverse uh, body of economic community. I heard that about eighty-seven or eighty-five percent of the Japanese uh, companies didn't decide to leave. Uh, 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 offer of the incentives notwithstanding. And if His Excellency, the Ambassador, uh, wants to make any comments on the issue. Oh, th thank you very much. Uh, I know that there's a very, very high expectation among Bangladesh people for Japanese companies to relocate uh, from China. But unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen uh, instantly. Uh, but also, I can tell you that uh, Japanese companies are looking at uh, Bangladesh as a new frontier of investment. And also right now, more than 300 Japanese companies are in operation in Bangladesh. And according to Jetro, 70% of those 300 companies are ready to expand their business operations in Bangladesh. So I have a uh, high hope uh, for those companies to expand their operation as well as a new investment coming from uh, Japan. But in order to uh, get those uh, prospective investors uh, coming to Bangladesh, uh, we, we really need to provide a really good, better investment climate. And one of the uh, selling points is that we are now working on a special economic zone, Japan exclusive uh, special economic zone in Arai Hajau that will be ready uh, by the end of next year. So that will yeah. provide international standard, Japanese standard, special economic zone. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, uh, increasing number of Japanese companies will make investment uh, into Bangladesh, uh, but probably not tomorrow. But in the near future, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. We have a question from a member of the audience, uh, and uh, he is uh, Mr. Abzalu Rahman from the International Relations Department. Question. Uh, let me read the question. How do you see the implications of Quad for the future of economic integration in the Asia Pacific? Do I, do I need to repeat the question? Professor no, 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 it's okay. This is the uh, importance, the implication for the quad. Quad is very this, important, right. you know. <laughs> this is more like an international uh, political, uh, yeah. I Mil think. Military, right. military politics. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe you can ask uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Again, I, I'm, no, I'm an economist, and so I'm not in a good position. Uh, to uh, uh, discuss quad, but uh, uh, yes, can, yes, can, not. Can, can I just uh, make one point? I, I'm I'm looking at this uh, result of a survey done by JBIC, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. They do 
annuals. This is uh, uh, coming back to this foreign direct investment. Japanese companies interested in Bangladesh. Uh, they ask question, what are the uh, promising countries for their investment uh, in the, uh, like a three, four year term? Uh, and Bangladesh in last year's uh, survey uh, is number 13. Uh, oh, which out of is, how many? Oh, out of, I don't know. Uh, could, they just list 10. And something, it, and you something. know, they list the important countries. I think each company is asked to list maybe three or four countries and they just, you know, uh, put them uh, tabulate in the, uh, put in the tabulation form. And uh, Bangladesh uh, is ahead of Australia, Korea, Singapore, oh. Brazil, UK, uh, Russia, Turkey. And uh, uh, so number 13 is uh, quite, quite good, uh, I have to say. Yeah, and uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, Bangladesh is climbing up the ladder, so to speak, from this ranking. Uh, again, so Bangladesh is one of the countries that Japanese con con companies are very interested in, I mean, looking at with a uh, strong interest. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Urata. We have another question from uh, Mr. Ishak. He raised his hand. Yeah, I, I'll talk to uh, Bangla to him. Ishak. He appeared on the screen briefly with a raised hand. option Again, Q&A uh, now, I'll ask uh, uh, Professor Monor Kobiri if he has a question. I have another question about uh, economic in integration. Yeah, I, uh, I was just wondering about one thing, and that is the relocation issue again. Relocation of, uh, in, of uh, relocation from investment from China to other countries. And Professor Urata has rightly said that it's, it may be from leaving China or investing in addition to Chinese investment. That is, China, investment in China will remain so, and those companies will not make new investment in China. New investments will be done in other countries like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, as he has mentioned. I had, a, I, I'm just, I was just wondering that this whole thing, particularly this relocation issue, and investing, making new investment in other countries uh, is not based on economic rationale, as I understand. If that is so, and if the decisions for new investment is made not on the rationality of economy, but economic basis, then what would be the situation in the global value chains? If let's say if companies can make produce efficiently goods in China, but for political reasons, they are not decided. They have decided like not, to invest, option is not to invest in China for political reasons and invested somewhere which was not going to be that much efficient and, and it's a cheap. Then what would be the situation in the global value chain? That, that I was just wondering. If it's, you call it one question, it's question. If you call it a comment, it's a comment. But uh, <laughs> if, if you help me uh, have some understanding of it. I, 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 I think I understand what you're trying to say. And I agree with you uh, from economic point of view, uh, you know, uh, these decisions are not made on the uh, basis of economic rationality. Uh, that means uh, the outcome will be not as efficient as otherwise. Uh, but the reality is that the, there's a risk, risk uh, either a political risk or you know, this natural uh, disaster risk like uh, COVID-19. Uh, 
companies have to take that into account in their uh, decision of the operation. So it's not just a political risk, which has become, you know, uh, can be maybe controlled, uh, but uh, natural resource risk, I mean, natural disaster risk, uh, global, global warming, uh, and all these uh, risks have to be taken into account when companies make the decision. Uh, so again, uh, compared to the case where all these risks can be dealt with without, uh, you know, uh, rather uh, easily uh, outcome of this uh, uh, company's dec decision uh, will be not as efficient or not as optimal as otherwise. I agree with you, right. And in that case, may I ask just one supplementary question, and that is, uh, I, I, I just wanted to know, I don't know, the companies which have already been working in China, mm. have they faced any problem? Have they faced the reduction of, reduced, reduction of their profit, rate of profit, or are they having problems? If not, then I think it's going to be uh, destabilizing for world market because global value chain is going to be disrupted and new value chain, efficient value chains is not going to be created overnight. Neither can I, I'm sure neither China nor Bangladesh can match, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, you know, China in terms of uh, efficiently delivering goods uh, through its chain. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how are the some companies which have not relocated uh, uh, their uh, their units production units from China? How are they doing even during the uh, COVID situation? Are they doing badly? I think they are doing fine. I think they are they are doing fine. Uh, as yes. as we all know, China uh, is one of the countries which succeeded, so to speak in dealing with this COVID-19. So they came back strongly you know, from the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so companies operating in China, uh, Japanese companies, American companies, uh, Chinese companies, I think they are doing much better than companies operating in other parts of the world. And I think this expression that I, I like, you know, Japanese company used to practice just in time production system, right? Now they are using, they are uh, 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 adopting just in case production system. So, you know, this just in case is a, a very good expression, I think, because uh, we have to be ready for possible risks or possible threat. Yeah, and that's I, a reality. I, yeah. I was kind of surprised because just this is my last comment and last point. I would. Uh, I was really surprised. We have some more questions. Uh, just yeah, one, one second. Professor, one, uh, professor have, Manuel Kobir and Professor Urata, we have some more questions yeah, from the 30, 30 uh, uh, and audience that's, that's coming yeah. in. No problem. Just thirty seconds. Okay. Okay. Yes, Go I was, ahead, please. I was. I was wondering because when China was in bad shapes after nineteen eighty nine, the mm -hmm. Tiananmen Square situation, it was China, Japan, right, supported China, which pushed the West to withdraw sanctions from, uh, from China. And uh, what is on the art that right now, China, Japan is contemplating, or the Japanese companies are com contemplating relocating its units from China. Any, in any case, it's probably there the are other questions that they, I will let them to ask this. OK. Another matter. Okay, okay, OK, go ahead. Uh, oh. Uh, just one second. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. The second question from Major Misba, who is an MPhil student, student in mm -hmm. political science. Uh, thanks for an informative presentation. In, uh, in, in, in your uh, presentation, you have mentioned that China wants to establish or improve relations with ASEAN countries. Do you think China can improve relations to neighbors with neighbors keeping the South China Sea and Senkaku issues alive. Now, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> South China Sea and Senkaku, I'm sure yeah. uh, Professor yeah. Urata doesn't yeah. want to speak today. Tomorrow, tomorrow this question. Yeah, again, uh, Professor yeah. Mich Michishita. He, he's a specialist in, you know, yeah. these uh, issues. Uh, yeah. uh, I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I shouldn't he's, say anything. He's, uh, uh, Major Mizba is writing his uh, Enfield thesis on South China Sea. I so, I, so this yeah, tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow, she, tomorrow, she, tomorrow, she tomorrow. has to wait. The, the third uh, question, the third <laughs> question, is, which comes from uh, who is the, the person, you know, how Bangladesh uh, can take the study opportunities uh, from Japan? Japan. Uh, I mean, I mean, it is probably coming from a student. He yeah. is uh, interested in uh, how Bangladeshi students can go to Japan to study. That's uh, academic mm. cooperation. And if uh, the ambassador could, uh, His Excellency, the ambassador could say a few words about it, like you students. Know how, many, how many Bangladesh students are now in Japan? Do you know how many? So more than three thousand students uh, in Japan. Mm -hmm. so I don't know three thousand. Uh, okay. You know, high enough or very low, but it is increasing, and uh, we are really hoping that this number three thousand students will increase, and in particular, universities like Waseda will increase uh, the number of students from Bangladesh. And Japanese government, uh, this Ministry of Education, uh, next offers uh, scholarship to Bangladesh students every year uh, around 130, if not 150. So there are plenty of opportunities for Bangladesh students to study mm -hmm. in Japan, mm -hmm. even on government uh, scholarship. So my hope is that even those students in social sciences are very you know, eager to apply for um, next, uh, next scholarship. Then, uh, you know, so far, a majority of students going to Japan, Japanese university on, <coughs> on science subject. But I'm sure that if social science students are eager to study in Japan, yes. opportunity will be there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, you have heard, uh, I think uh, the delegation that came, uh, Japanese embassy delegation that came to us in 2019, they mentioned that the education attaché in the Japanese embassy can be contacted by students and, uh, and uh, the web page of the embassy leads you to the attaché, education attaché, and you can inquire there how, what kinds of opportunities exist there. To my knowledge, quite a few students are studying in Japan. We have some more, uh, some more questions. Uh, see. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let me see. How to... Okay. Uh, uh, this is a, a question from a student. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Sumaya. I want to know about the scholarships and political science. Okay, Sumaya, uh, the co question has been answered, I'm sure, by the ambassador, His Excellency the ambassador, that uh, you uh, you should go uh, and uh, see the web page, ministry web page, and also the embassy web page, and you will be able to find information. Okay, Mr. Abzal has another question, but I will give you uh, an opportunity later. We have to accommodate Mr. Abkas Ahmed uh, is the Associate Professor of Political Science. And I should mention that he was, he's a Manbashu scholar in my department. And he completed uh, his master's degree in Japan on a Manbashu scholarship in GRIPS. He was, mm. so his Mich question. Professor uh, Michishita tomorrow. He's from He's, Grips, so. Yes, we have noticed that. <laughs> and, um, uh, Mr. Akkas uh, knows that uh, and he's eager to meet him. Uh, Mr. Akkas's question is, I want to know about the Bay of Bengal Industrial Belt and building a deep sea port in Sonadia. So Sonadia, I thought would come up and uh, it is uh, uh, the Big B program, how far it has proceeded, if you know anything, uh, uh, Professor Urata, Sorry, uh, uh, if you can mention. Uh, his Excellency Ambassador. Uh, or, Sorry, the, or His Excellency yes. the Ambassador. And uh, uh, if, light on it. if you can share some information on Matarbari, how much progress has been made in Matarbari. I have already read that a liquefied natural gas 
has been purchased. Uh, has, uh, that has been a contract by Bangladesh on liquefied uh, natural uh, gas. Deep sea port construction is going on in Matabari. Uh, oh. together with uh, uh, coal-fired power stations. So okay. uh, the two jetties are already uh, complete in Matabari. Uh, so, and construction is going on on coal-fired power plants. And the first two units will start in operation in 2024, and further two units will be in operation in 2025. So okay. those are the years in which uh, Matabari will start operating for the purpose of uh, transporting coal. And that's the first issue. And second issue, second stage is to uh, develop LNG terminal, LPG terminal, as well as some port facilities, including container terminal. So uh, that work will be done probably, say, from, uh, from now, uh, five to six years time. And Matawari's plan is further down to enhance the container uh, handling capacity so eventually, Matabari Deep Seaport will exceed the container handling capacity of Chittagong. So I can't tell you when exactly, but it, when Matabari is ready uh, in full-fledged manner, so that will have a very, very uh, strong impact on connectivity, as well as sea transportation, import, export for Bangladesh. So there used to be this idea of having Shonadia Deep, deep Seaport project. Uh, but this idea was dropped uh, last year. So now on this island, Matabari Shonadia Island, uh, there's only one project uh, going on, which is uh, Matabari Deep Sea Port Construction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have one or two questions left. Uh, okay. Okay. What are the challenges for Japan in managing global value chain uh, in the post COVID world? that what is kind of touched by Professor Urata about the impact of COVID-19 on the economic integration in Asia Pacific. That last question, Professor Urata probably wants to answer. Mm -hmm. What is your view about the impact of COVID-19 on the economic integration in Asia Pacific? Mm. You know, COVID-19 has, uh serious impacts, uh, uh, not only economic, but also maybe political scenes. Uh, but as for uh, uh, global value chains, uh, companies are now really uh, thinking hard as to how to deal with this, uh, uh, not only COVID-19, but uh, maybe future uh, infectious disease. That's poss it's a high possibility. And uh, uh, again, so uh, it really depends on the companies how they try to deal with this. Some companies try to reshore the operation back to Japan. Uh, and that, uh, I think uh, many researchers, economists do not really agree that is the best strategy because Japan is prone to have natural disasters like earthquake. So a better strategy may be to diversify their uh, uh, supply chains, global value chains. And also uh, many companies are now trying to use digital technology to overcome some of the problems which they are now faced with. In other words, uh, like, you know, this kind of uh, online uh, meetings is getting very popular, much more popular now than before. So uh, not, I mean, like COVID-19 made us, made it very difficult for us to travel overseas, uh, across uh, borders. Uh, and so some companies are trying to use this digital technology to overcome, to deal with these problems. And that of course will change the form of supply chains. And some companies are trying to use, uh, you know, uh, us, uh, again, digital technology, instead of sending or exporting parts and components to their affiliates in foreign country, many parts can <clears throat> be exported, so to speak, digitally by sending, you know, uh, uh, data and using 3D printing kind of technology 
you don't need to physically export uh, uh, components to the affiliates. So again, that will be a very maybe important way to deal with this such you know uh, a crisis or, or risk. So again, uh, many companies are really trying to come up with uh, uh, you know the strategy they 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 they. Uh, they uh, incorporate uh, in the future. Uh, I think this is a time that they are really spending a lot of time and energy and money to formulate the uh, future uh, form of uh, global value chain. Uh, I think one of the key words that I hear recently is like resilience, resilience of uh, supply chain. Of course, resilience means maybe different things to different companies, uh, but uh, resilience uh, very often is used to describe the situation that companies can uh, uh, come back quickly. I mean, you know, some parts of supply chains are, are, are broken, uh, disrupted, then they can either rebuild the uh, uh, supply chain quickly or they can use alternative uh, uh, chain, so to speak, channels. So again, so uh, I don't have a quick and good answer to your question, but I know uh, many companies and the governments are trying to come up with uh, 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 best, so to speak, quote unquote, best uh, uh, form of supply chain to deal with future possible future uh, risks. That, that's all I can say. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Urata. Uh, we are, we, uh, let me just check uh, if we have uh, any more questions in, uh, in the box. Uh, okay, uh, we, have a, we have a, we have a um, comment and a question wrapped in one, one pack. First of all, I would like to thank the government of Japan for helping Bangladesh through the JICA projects. Okay. That's coming from a student, a senior level of student. He wants to thank uh, the Japanese government for uh, helping uh, Bangladesh uh, with, through the JICA projects. Uh, secondly, I would like to know how much, uh, how accurately Japan has observed uh, con the completion of works under uh, this, uh, under the projects uh, funded by Japan. Okay, uh, so uh, the question is, uh, uh, how accurately or how closely is uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese government observing how the projects are being implemented? Uh, are, they being, uh, are they being supervised the project, the implementation date, uh, the date fixed for implementation at the original stage? It's taking for um, the, the, the projects to be finished. If uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador, has something to say, especially uh, what, uh, we, you have already said about the Matarbari project, it's going to take five or six more years to come near to completion. You have said that. Would you like to make any comment about the Metro Railroad project funded by JICA? Uh, I, I didn't mean to say that, that this original plan will be delayed by five, six years. No, 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 that's not it. Uh, that, uh, uh, this the first stage of uh, development of Matabari Seaport uh, is mainly for the construction of uh, coal fired power stations. So that will be done uh, 24 or 25. So mm -hmm. almost in line with the original timeline uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. So, but there will be the second stage of development, third mm -hmm. stage of development. Mm -hmm. uh, that will take much time further. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that this metro line. Uh, there has been some delay because of uh, uh, COVID situation. Mm -hmm. so originally, the line six of Dhaka Metro uh, was uh, supposed to be in operation partially by the end of this year, mm -hmm. but it looks like uh, that will not happen. So sometime uh, next year, towards the end of next year, most likely uh, partial opening or opening of line six of uh, Dhaka Metro uh, will take place. So about a uh, year or so delay has been taking place because of COVID situation. 
But currently, JICA is not doing not only line six, but line one, as well as line five. So those three metal lines will be uh, ready. So during uh, 2020s, hopefully. So then uh, uh, looks like uh, 3 million people of those people in Dhaka uh, will use uh, metal line every day. So uh, I hope that will change the lifestyle of uh, Dhaka as well as to mitigate this traffic situation in Dhaka. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, ju just the last question. And, no, uh, madam, we... madam, Madam, may yes. I say? Madam, yes. there is yes, a question yes. you have missed, I guess. There is a question in the chat box. Yes, yes. I have seen them. I have seen yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. We, we have one question from the student body that has been directed to us. Another problem, a teacher to all the panelists. Uh, uh, I will uh, ask the question from the teacher first, and then the, uh, uh, the question, how does the US-China trade war impact on Japan? A very interesting question that mm -hmm. Professor Urata might want okay, to really okay. handle. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, yes, well, any friction, of course, you know, including US-China trade friction or trade war has put uh, Japan and other countries in a very difficult situation, of course. <clears throat> uh, a decoupling from China is, uh, uh, I guess, the, uh, one of the key phrases that the US like to use and Japan follow uh, the US uh, uh, when it comes to national security, of course. So when it comes to like a uh, global value chain, uh, people talk, you know, ask whether Japan will be uh, decoupling from China in global value chain. And here uh, you, I know it's very difficult, but uh, uh, companies uh, try to differentiate or to classify value chain in two types. One uh, to deal with uh, one uh, value chain dealing with the kind of national security uh, issues. They like to decouple from China, but the value chain which involve products which have nothing to do with or very little to do with national security, they like to have uh, China included in value chain. But of course, dual use technology and all kind of thing makes it very difficult to differentiate or classify uh, value chains in these two types. But at least these are the uh, kind of, uh, I think policy that or strategy companies try to uh, uh, pursue. And they are watching very closely how the US government uh, responds to this China threat because the US is a very important country, not only for you know, political reasons, but also for business reasons. When the US pursues uh, decoupling from China policy in certain products, uh, any uh, companies, including Japanese or Bangladesh or Australia, they cannot sell their products to the United States, for example. So uh, they are watching very closely how the US is responding to this uh, threat. And they try to, uh, I, th I think many companies in Japan are trying to uh, deal with these issues by having two types of value chains, like the one I explained. So again, uh, I, well, let me just say one more thing. Japan uh, and the US are not exactly the same in my view. Uh, and Japan has some uh, uh, economic cooperation projects with China, infrastructure building, for example, in Thailand, I understand. They do cooperate uh, as much as maybe they can. And through this economic cooperation or cooperation, Japan, in my view, like to see China, the importance of international standard, for example, infrastructure building. There are kind of, you know, critics, they have been criticized for the so-called debt diplomacy by Chinese, uh, by many international communities. Uh, so uh, in order to construct high quality infrastructure using international standard, uh, Japan hope to <clears throat> hope U.S. I mean, sorry, Japan hope China will 
learn and China will uh, uh, abide by these international rules in constructing infrastructure together. So again, uh, I think in my view, you know, Japan uh, is trying to use a more kind of friendly, art friendly kind of attitude or cooperation attitude with China so that China can change their behavior to comply with the international standard. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one question from the student body. And that is, uh, uh, I have lost it, uh, student <clears throat> body. Uh, okay, I remember the question. The question was, why is it that we have such good relations with Japan? <laughs> and why is it that we, uh, Japan, invests uh, so much in uh, Bangladesh? Uh, the main question is, why is it, how come that we have such good relations with Japan? I think the ambassador, since uh, His Excellency the ambassador is here, <laughs> he may be yeah. able to say that the, the Japanese like us very much. Mike, <laughs> from the, His Excellency the ambassador. Oh, it's it's other way around. The Bangladesh people like us very much. Yes. And like <laughs> very much. So there is a natural sense of affinity between Japanese people and the Bangladesh people. I think that is something uh, we should really enjoy and we should really cherish for further development of a partnership and development and a, a partnership and friendship. So that's I really feel uh, having been here uh, more than twenty months now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I would just like to add your uh, uh, supporting what uh, uh, His Excellency and the Ambassador has said. Japan, uh, Japan's cultural relations with uh, Bangladesh has improved because of globalization and because of uh, 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 visits and etc. Et For instance, um, uh, one of my best friends is a Japanese. And uh, by sheer coincidence, his name is Suga, like the prime minister's <laughs> <laughs> name. And we have, a, we have cherished a friendship of almost 30 years. We keep uh, in touch. And uh, I, I have been talking about uh, Japanese authors, uh, reading Japanese authors. And now I hear from my children about Japanese, famous Japanese authors like Murakami, Kogichowa, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the writer who wrote uh, the Never Let Me Go, uh, Ishiguro, and also Yan, mm -hmm. Yanigahara. So Japan is uh, becoming uh, important on the global scene. And uh, uh, I will, um, uh, in a minute, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Monwar Kubit. We have come close uh, to the uh, finish, finish line. Just uh, a comment uh, from the teacher uh, community uh, of the social science faculty. Heartfelt thanks to Professor Urata for his excellent presentation. We are very much thankful to the Japanese government and the embassy of Japan for providing the vaccines for Bangladesh. That's a big thank you. And uh, Japan provided it through COVAX. Uh, thank you so much for all webinar CAS. And that's a thank you to uh, the CAS. Uh, mm. Uh, I, I want to say just one sentence. This is a time of transformation. Great shifts are taking place globally. And one can perceive uh, that a major power shift is taking place. Although the Chinese have said that they don't want any shift, they want to uh, cooperate with the United States. But uh, the, uh, the transformation is visible. And we hope, our hope uh, from uh, the Bangladeshi's hope that Japan can play a very constructive role in this shift in maintaining stability and peace. Now the floor is over to Professor Monwar Kabir to make the concluding remarks. Thank you, Professor Dr. Begum, <coughs> Dr. Anwar Begum. Uh, what can I say? I, th I think uh, a lot have been said in the process. And I myself had uh, two, three questions, and that those questions were answered. Uh, I, I mean, uh, superbly by Professor Urata. I would like to thank everybody. I'm not going to uh, spend any time on the subject of the presentation today because it has been discussed thoroughly. I would like 
really as i may, as my colleague said heartfelt congratulations to professor urata and the and the ambassador his excellency ambassador ito uh, sir ito and uh, naoki and uh, japanese embassy foreign ministry and uh, i also really would like to thank uh, all of them particularly uh, professor urata and his excellency ambassador my colleagues my students and people from the japanese embassy i guess they i can see them on the screen see their name on the screen so i would like to thank everybody who are involved in it and who participated in this in, in this lecture the first of the two lecture series and with that with, with my heartfelt thanks and their participation in tomorrow's session and their continuous support for our economic endeavors and activities with that note i would like to conclude today's session thank you so much thank you everybody